Good morning, all. Despite the fact that it is an absurdly early hour, <laughs> and that I'm starting five minutes after the even more absurdly early time listed on the program, uh, I want to welcome you to what I hope is going to be an absurdly full, full and absurdly interesting full day discussion of ethics, law, and politics of de extinction. I have been really captivated by this possibility for the last couple of years, last year and a half or so, since it uh, came, came back in a more real fir form. But I have to tell you, this is a topic I've had in the back of my mind, at least, for almost 15 years. Because in this very building in 1999, one of my law students, a kid named Corey Salzberg, wrote a paper for my law and genetics class called resurrecting the woolly mammoth, in which he laid out what he thought were the ethical, legal, political, religious, social issues that would be involved in resurrecting the woolly mammoth. This was shortly after the announcement of the birth of Dolly, the first cloned sheep. His scientific method for resurrecting the woolly mammoth turned out not to be plausible, to say the least. He was hoping someone would find viable frozen mammoth sperm and eggs in the permafrost. But his discussion of it, this discussion of the impact, was, I thought, really interesting, one of the most interesting student papers I'd gotten. So I encouraged him strongly to publish it. He published it in the Stanford Technology Law Review in the year 2000. It is, I think, the first piece of analysis published about ethical and legal issues in de-extinction. And then, as far as I was concerned, the issue went away for about 10 or 12 years. I kept, you know, when there would be something in the press that vaguely talked about mammoths in Siberia or something else of interest, my ears would prick up, I'd look at it, and I thought, gee, it would be interesting if this ever happened. In January 2012, I got a phone call from Jamie Shreve at National Geographic, a reporter and editor who was asking me about uh, an issue around law and neuroscience, and he said, by the way, do you know anything about bringing back extinct species? And I said, well, yeah, a little. Why do you ask? And he said, well, there are these really interesting people, Stuart Brand and Ryan Phelan. And they've been talking to us about possibly bringing back extinct species. One thing led to another. A couple of workshops and a TEDx later, uh, I continue to think that de-extinction is a really, really fascinating idea. What I am not necessarily convinced of, one way or the other, is how good an idea it is. My current view is that it is, a, it is worth pursuing in a careful and prudent way. But I don't have a great deal of confidence of, in that, either in terms of whether it's too liberal or whether it's too conservative. And being a very selfish person, I decided it would be great to have a conference so I could get a better sense of what my own view should be. You guys get to be the beneficiary, I hope, of my selfishness, together with Alex Camacho, who's here from University of California at Irvine, who's finishing his breakfast, and Jake Sherko, fellow at the Center for Law and Biosciences, we've put together a conference co-sponsored by our two institutions to explore the ethical, legal, political issues in de-extinction. And I hope with people on both sides, or maybe I should say on all sides, I'm not sure there are only two sides here, looking at these issues to try to inform those of us in the audience, try to inform those who will be watching on the web, try to, uh, not watching, we don't have a live stream on the web, but uh, these talks are being televised, are being videotaped and will be posted later on the web, and generally to inform the discussion of the merits, the potential, and the potential risks of de-extinction. We've tried to organize the day to maximize the possibilities for discussion. We lay out, we hope, some of the background, but try to keep lots of time for discussion amongst the participants and between the participants and the audience. As soon as I shut up, which will be fairly soon, you'll hear some background on the science from Professor Beth Shapiro from the University of Santa Cruz. Most of the day then, after Beth, is organized in terms of panels. We have a panel on environmental legal issues featuring Andrew Torrance from the University of Kansas, Alex Camacho, from co-organizer from UCI, and Chuck Bottom, the director of California's Department of Fish and Wildlife. Then we have a break. We like breaks. 
followed by a panel on other legal issues. Matthew Liebman from the Animal Legal Defense Fund, uh, Jake Shurko from one of the co-organizers from here at Stanford, and Dan Farber from UC Berkeley will be talking about some of the other legal issues that might come up, whether they're animal welfare issues, whether they're liability issues, whether they're property, including intellectual property issues. For each of these panels, I've asked the speakers to hold to 15 minutes, and I will be glaring at them from the front row of the room, giving them time signals to try to hold them on the panels to 15 minutes. Uh, so leaving a half hour at least, probably a half hour at most, knowing the way things go, but around a half hour for general discussion after each of the panels. Following, and during that general discussion, by the way, particularly since this is being recorded and will be available on the web, we would ask anybody asking questions to come to these two microphones at the front of the two aisles so that your questions can be recorded for posterity. We have lunch, a free lunch with a free conference, and during lunch, Stuart Brand will talk about the extinction. Stuart, uh, I'll introduce him at the time, but I'll just say now he probably needs no introduction. After lunch, we have two more panels, a panel on de-extinction and conservation biology, featuring Stanley Temple, Kate Jones, and Jamie Rappaport-Clark. Uh, Stan, unfortunately, is only here, only gonna be able to be here in spirit. His flight from Madison, Wisconsin was canceled yesterday because of tornado warnings. But if our AV wizards can make their wizardry work, we'll be able to project his PowerPoints and magically have his voice appear from 1,800 miles away, giving his talk to his PowerPoints, even though tornadoes have kept him in Madison. Kate, joining us from London, is going to talk, uh, Stan is going to talk about possible uses and limits to uses of de-extinction technologies in conservation biology. Kate's going to talk about conservation biology and what it might say about setting priorities for de-extinction. And Jamie is going to talk about the politics of de-extinction. One more break, and then we have, I don't know whether they'll like this or not, but what I'm thinking in my mind of as the philosophers panel, we have philosophers talking about justice, hubris, moral issues, the meaning of the universe, the meaning of life, and everything else of importance. Hilary Bach from Johns Hopkins, Jay Odenbaugh from Lewis and Clark, and Ronald Sandler from Northeastern will be taking on some of those deeper issues around the extinction. The last session of the day has the clever name plenary session. My idea, my plan for that is to bring all the speakers up and let them all talk about whatever they're interested in, whatever sparked their interest in the course of the day, as well as interact with the audience with whatever sparked your interest in the course of the day. So that's the plan for the day. We hope you find it interesting. The speaker, the little handout you've got, does have biographies for all of the speakers. So when we do our introductions, we will be very brief. And I want to provide a model for that right now, a model for my colleagues, Alex and Jake. Our next speaker will be Beth Shapiro, talking about the science of de-extinction. Beth is a professor at the University of California at Santa Cruz recently moved here from Penn State. And you can read all about her in the handout. Beth, the floor is yours. Great. All right, I don't know um, if it'll be possible to turn down the lights just here so that we can yes. see. Yes. That I think I can even do. <laughs> I come from a lab in uh, Santa Cruz. We actually focus on ancient DNA. So we are very interested in developing technologies that make it easier to get genomic information out of fossils and things, which is an obvious thing that we'll have to figure out how to do if we are going to de-extinct things. And so um, I've had to learn a little bit about like real science in order to come here and talk to you. But luckily, you're not. Um, you're hopefully nice, and you're not going to attack me if I get little facts wrong. But um, we'll see. Anyway, so de-extinction um, with the hashtag is, uh, is the topic today. And I like to use the hashtag because I think this term is kind of new and it's really kind of hype of something that people have been thinking about for a long time. So I think adding the hashtag really puts it in that appropriate context. 
It was made for somebody taller than me. Is that better? All right, so my talk today uh, is really one part, the part in the middle there. I will give a, a little bit of background. Still no good? <laughs> is this okay? Okay, good. Um, there, are, there are three methods that people are talking about, scientific methods, to bring extinct things back to life, and these are broken down as backbreeding, cloning, and then what Hank likes to call genome editing. I think that's a pretty good, pretty good way to, to summarize what is involved in that last process. And I'll talk a little bit about each of those, and you know, during the day and later on in the day, I'll happily answer more questions about that. <laughs> It's all right. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, who knows what uh, Richard Attenborough and B.D. Wong have to do with the extinction? And B.D. Wong, he was the lead scientist who was actually bringing them back. So I thought we should get this out of the way at the very beginning of this particular particular meeting here. We should talk about this right away. Um, it was uh, their fault that we had the first thing brought back to life, or the, at least in the imagination of this guy. And so just to get it out of the way, let's make it clear that this isn't going to happen. This is way too old. There's no genetic material left. But if we're thinking about something more recent, then the Pleistocene covers about the last two million years or so. Um, something more recent, then this is a, a maybe. Perhaps this is looking through something that we could bring back to life. So because you guys are lawyers, I thought we would start off with some semantics, right? So there are three phrases in here that we really need to talk about. And uh, um, something extinct is the first thing. And, and you'd think that this was an easy topic, but actually it's not. And as we've started an easy definition, as we've started talking to people about what things they would like to bring back from extinction, people start talking about subspecies that might have disappeared or populations of things that might have disappeared. And so knowing whether or not that qualifies as something that really is extinct is a pretty big problem that we have to get over. If we bring back a subspecies of kangaroo rat, for example, that is extinct, is the public going to react and say, well, it wasn't really extinct. It was just a subspecies. It didn't even look different from the thing that was still alive. And so we have to think about whether or not, what does it mean to be a species, which is a pretty big question in biology, and what does it mean that that species is extinct? Bringing back. So this becomes a problem to think about, especially when we start getting into the third method that people want to use to bring extinct species back for de-extinction, which is this copy and paste editing. If you're only going to bring back some genes of an extinct thing and not the entire genome, we need to come up with a way to determine when it is, how much of a genome or what parts of a genome need to be brought back in order to make it qualify as an actual de-extinction event. And then life, I think this is something more for the ethicists to think about, does the bringing back of something for a few minutes count as a de-extinction event? Does bringing back one thing for a little while so we can study it count as a de-extinction event? These are all semantic arguments and some of them even some of the major questions that we've come up with in a class that I've recently finished teaching about de-extinction are, how does one choose what species to de-extinct? And these are things that my students agreed with the rest of us, because we're all sitting here having done this, our open questions. How does one actually do the de-extinction? How do you know when a species is no longer extinct? What do you actually do with the species once it is de-extinct? And then all the ethics and liability that hopefully I get to learn something about today. So who should we bring back? We've come up with a list of criteria. This is from some our first year graduate students at Santa Cruz who like this. So, so what are the criteria we should use to choose something to bring back? We seem to think that the, the most important thing is that it's not something that's going to kill us, which is kind of a reasonable thing to think about. But also that we don't want it to annoy us. We don't want it to get in our way. We don't want it to make giant swarms of billions of things. We don't want to, um, it to hurt us in any way, and we really just don't want to have to bother with it unless we want to be excited about it or go see it in a zoo. We want it not to take up much space, and we don't want it to cost too much to actually do. We don't want it to be too specialized so that we have to work really hard to give it its habitat, but then on the other hand, we don't want it to be too generalist either because we don't want it to be able to expand beyond whatever we think its limits are too easily. 
We want it to function independently so that we don't have to invest too much energy on um, rearing it or teaching it how to behave because we don't really know how an extinct species should have behaved, but not so independent that it can, as in Jurassic Park, take off and do crazy stuff that we're not too happy about. And finally, and this kind of surprised me when we came up with this, we, uh, we want to know what killed it, that doesn't surprise me, but we want it to be that we killed it because some aspect of de-extinction de seems to be in uh, assaulting people's guilt. So if we feel bad about it, then it makes it better somehow for us to actually spend the time, the money, and effort to bring it back. So thinking about who kind of then gets us into the science, and I thought it would be a good introduction because it really limits the things that we are going to try to bring back to life using these scientific approaches if we narrow down the list of what things it is that we want to bring back to life. So in the next section, I'm going to draw on work done by a bunch of different people. I'm not really going to highlight them specifically in these different counterparts um, where I'm talking about, the different sections that I'm talking about, but I just wanted to draw your attention to some of the very clever people who I have a lot of respect for who are doing the science of de-extinction in their labs right now. So back breeding. This is pretty much the, the simplest avenue to de-extinction, but it might also take the longest and it might be the hardest to know whether we've brought something back to life or not. So the idea with backbreeding is kind of straightforward as a mental exercise anyway. Uh, we know that as people, we have the power to change the phenotypes of things. This is what we did when we domesticated the things that we'd like to eat and the animals that we'd like to be with us. We found one phenotype and by careful <coughs> selection and directed breeding, we made these things into stuff that we like better. We took wolves and we made them into dogs. We took Jacinta and we made it into corn. We can do this. Backbreeding is kind of the same thing, but rather than making it something that we like better that might be more, as we know, domesticated, we're going to make things that are less of what we like, given that probably we didn't like them so much, which is why they went extinct in the first place. The best example of this ongoing today is a project called Rewilding Europe. And Henri here has been a, a devoted member of the de-extinction community since it's come up, and he's very interested in this project. Rewilding Europe is focusing on bringing back the auroch, which is an extinct cow. It was very big and kind of mean, and probably why we made it go extinct in the first place. And here's a cave painting of the auroch showing that they were a big part of the native ecosystem, the native fauna from Europe prior to their extinction. Um, the idea of bringing back the Uruk via, via backbreeding is not new. Um, in fact, the, the, it was first taken up by some brothers, Lutz and Heinz Heck, in about 1920. They started doing this experiment. And they have actually brought a species, of, a kind of species, a subspecies maybe, or a, a type, phenotype of cow back called the Heck cattle, also called the New Uruk. It's smaller than the Uruk, but they've selected for features of the Uruk that they like, the shape of its horns, some behavioral characteristics and the shape of its body and, and back. In fact, when I was looking for examples on the internet of this, I found there's a place where you can actually go on the web and find an, a cow every day. And the new Uruk has its own day in the calendar of cows. Um, you can go here and find this if you'd like to. Um, but my daily cow says the, the new Uruk does exist. People argue that it doesn't really look like an Uruk, that, uh, that we do need more selective breeding to make things look like an Uruk. <coughs> And so they're intending to use backbreeding. So if we're going to use backbreeding for de-extinction for other animals, we have to think more about what traits we would like to see in the de-extinct animals. So a cow has a generation time of somewhere between three and six years. If we want to make a mammoth by choosing hairier and hairier and possibly bigger and bigger elephants, they have a generation time between 20 and 25 years. So it would take a lot longer, potentially, to do this. But I don't see why it's not possible. Um, this is something that we could just go out there and choose some hairier elephants, make sure they breed with each other, and then let those offspring that are showing this, this exaggerated trait that we like, let them breed with each other, and eventually we could come up with an elephant that's hairier. Is that a mammoth? I don't know. The second avenue toward de-extinction is what's broadly known as cloning. And there are a bunch of different scientific protocols that are used in cloning. I'm just very briefly going to go through these here. When we think of cloning, we probably think of Dolly the sheep. And this, kind of creepily, is actually Dolly stuffed. I had no idea that they stuffed her, but they did. So this is Dolly. 
Um, and she was a, the first successful mammal to have what they call somatic cell nuclear transfer. It wasn't the first successful cloning attempt, though. That actually honor belongs to a xenopus frog that John Gurdon, in experiments in the 50s and 60s, managed to clone from intestinal cells. Um, he recently won the Nobel Prize for this, shared with um, a Japanese scientist who's on the next slide, for actually causing the first cloning to happen. Now, he didn't know at the time why it worked when they took intestinal cells from an adult frog, or actually from a tadpole, and inserted it into egg cells and made another frog, but it did. Now we know why it happened, but this is basically the process of somatic cell nuclear transfer. You take an egg cell and you get rid of the nucleus that's in it using a very tiny micro pipette. You suck it out of the thing so you have an empty or enucleated egg cell, and you insert a mammary cell. For, or a nucleus from a memory cell, you zap it with electricity. This breaks the membrane that's around the egg cell, causing the nucleus to dump into the cell. And then it starts behaving like a cell that is undifferentiated, that doesn't know what it's supposed to be doing. So it starts, it goes from being a memory cell that has a particular line, it knows what it's supposed to be doing, it becomes undifferentiated, and then can start subdividing and making all the different cell types, eventually forming um, a surrogate loop. You, this is not a very efficient process. Not a very efficient process at all. Um, in fact, less than 25% of these things that actually happen ever come to term. I think with Dolly, there was something like 57 of these that actually worked out of several hundred, and then only one actually went to term. Um, this is a, it's pretty common that these, it doesn't work, or at least it doesn't work very efficiently. We know now that it did work, and this is uh, Shinya Yamanaka, who shared the Nobel Prize with John Gurdon for uh, this cloning technology. He discovered that when you take a cell that is already differentiated and you put it in a, a Petri dish, and then you can add things called transcription factors. It's actually a cocktail of about four different transcription factors that you add to these cells. That makes them de-differentiate. It makes them forget that they were already traveling along this particular pathway of becoming a particular type of cell. And they go back to what's called an induced pluripotent stem cell. So stem cells can do whatever they want to. If you have an embryonic stem cell, they can do everything. They will eventually become every type of cell in the body. A pluripotent stem cell can become almost every type of cell in the body, and we tend to hope that they can become every type of cell in the body. So we have an induced pluripotent stem cell that can then go on to subdivide, then go on to differentiate into these different cellular pathways if we add these transcription factors to the mix. And we do have a bunch of different animals that have now been cloned. Um, copycat and Second Chance kind of highlight the opportunity to come up with really crap names for things that are clones. I think are, is quite, quite an amusing thing. But then we have you know, all the other things that have highlighted our attention. I think about 24 different species have been cloned to date, including an entire herd of cattle um, by Advanced Cell Technology, which is from in New York City who were interested in making cattle that can produce human albumin. Human albumin is, uh, is important in, in surgeries and in treating burns and things like that. And so the idea was to make some cattle that could produce a human gene in doing this um, by changing some of the gene. There are also interspecific clones. These are clones in which you've taken a cell or an induced pluripotent stem cell from one particular species, made it into a functioning embryo, and then inserted it into a different species mom, surrogate mother, to ask it to grow up. And there have been fewer of these, and these are even harder to make work. Um, this is Noah, who was one of the first that was born. He did not live very long, about two days, and he died of lung failure. And then there was this mouflon domestic sheep that was born about the same time. And this bantang, and this bantang is interesting, another another advanced cell technology project here, because the cells that were used to make the induced pluripotent stem cells that were eventually used to make the embryo that became this Bantang were actually frozen for 24 years prior to being used for this purpose. And they were frozen as part of the San Diego Zoo's frozen zoo collection, which is an important resource for conservation and will be an important resource for de-extinction as this idea grows and begins to take off. And of course, we couldn't get over this section without bringing up Celia, which was the first kind of success of cloning technology. This was done by a group in Spain. This is a bucardo, which is a, uh, an ibex. 
And th when there were only a few blue cards still alive, they decided they were going to try to do directed hybridization with these guys. It turned out it was really, really hard. They got stressed out and didn't mate. And when they did mate, it didn't result in fertile in any fertilization when they were in captivity. They would run away from the researchers. And there was this tiny little ledge that was around the lab that they were using. And because they're, they're mountain goats, um, they would climb up somehow onto this ledge really high away from the researchers who were trying to get at them to induce the fertility. So this really wasn't working. When there was only one individual left, um, Celia, they captured her, they blindfolded her and, and gave her some meds to make her less stressed. And they took some, some somatic cells, some body cells, not egg cells. And they eventually used these to make uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, which they put into a surrogate mother that they actually found had to be a hybrid ibex and domestic goat. They couldn't use domestic goats because evolutionarily it was too distant from the ibex to actually allow them to have success when they were doing their hybridization experiments earlier. And, and a calf was born that lived for a very short time, 12 minutes. But this was the birth of an animal from a different animal after the species had officially gone extinct. So it could be the very first successful de extinction. There's something that all of these experiments have in common, though. And I've talked about somatic cell nuclear transfer, embryonic stem cells, induced pluripotent stem cells. You notice all of these things have something in common. And it's these C's, the C's. And there are no C's in paleogenome, or in fossil, or in mummy, or in pleistoene. <laughs> well, it doesn't work as well, but uh, anyway, you get my point. If we go out into the field and we get these bones, there aren't any full intact cells in these bones. There are not any intact cells in museum specimens. You really need frozen cell lines that have been taken from things prior to when they were extinct. And that is the problem. If we are going to de-extinct something that's any older than something that we recently killed, we're stuck with dealing with ancient DNA. And ancient DNA is just kind of not fun. And you see that um, we always think that we're going to find complete frozen cells and things, much like Hank's student many years ago. And you see this headline here from the Daily Mail. One step closer to Jurassic Park, first living cells found in a woolly mammoth. There were not living cells found in any woolly mammoth, and there weren't going to be. Of course, this particular um, publication has brought you other enticing headlines, such as women become good cooks at 55 when they finally can boil an egg. And just one cannabis joint can cause psychiatric episodes. This particular uh, article won the Orwellian Award for Journalistic Excellence, which is um, an award given out for the most inaccuracies in any scientific report in a short time. But a few days ago, we find that, again, we are in the midst of a very big push of excitement where it is claimed that um, some Russian scientists doing excavation in Siberia have found a mammoth and it has flowing blood, I don't believe that, and complete cells, I don't believe that either. Um, these are bison, by the way. That's not a mammoth. I know that that's just a picture. But, and, and so this is exciting. This is, a, this is a very exciting new thing. Of course, we should hold our excitement because it was again reported in the Daily Mail that we were going to bring it back to life. So hmm, got a little bit of a, of, of, a, of a weight on that one. So why is ancient DNA so bad? A genome, when we sequence a genome, we know we're not going to have any cells. We, we, we think we're, what we're going to have to do eventually is, is sequence the entire genome of something, just piece by piece, one little DNA piece at a time. And this is kind of what we want. With ancient DNA, what we get is more something like this. And that's because there's, there's two major problems when we're dealing with ancient DNA. The first is that it is replete with different types of DNA damage. And we, we know what kinds of DNA damage we're going to find in ancient DNA specimens. It's mostly damage caused by UV radiation, caused by water, um, caused by actual shearing of the DNA molecules. And these things begin to accumulate immediately after an animal dies. There are bacterial enzymes, even enzymes within an animal's own cells and plant's own cells that will act to break down these membranes and begin to break down the DNA immediately after they die. 
And so that is why there's not going to be any particular whole cell that we're ever going to find in something that's dead. And a mummy is a special case of this too. Everybody gets very excited when we find a mummy, but mummies tend to have had a huge bacterial load or infestation at one point circulating throughout the bloodstream while they were in the process of mummification. And this means that their DNA is actually tends to be in worse shape than bones that we find that have been defleshed and then immediately buried. So we find that there's all these types of DNA damages in these bones. We can't get long fragments of DNA. As a molecular biologist, if I were to go in and do a PCR amplification, just try to sequence a long strand of DNA from something that's alive, I could do a long range PCR and get 18, 20,000 base pairs at a time. With ancient DNA, I'm lucky if I can get 100. If we're trying to piece together a genome that's three billion base pairs long, I'm gonna have to do a lot of work to piece together 100 base pairs at a time to get those things together. The other problem with ancient DNA is that when you extract the DNA from a bone, you don't just get DNA from the animal that was there or from a mummy. In this case, this is a, a depiction of the DNA that was recovered from one extraction of a mammoth, that was a bone, that uh, was recovered from the Siberian permafrost. And from this particular bone, we got about 53% mammoth DNA. The rest of it was stuff like bacteria or um, any other sort of environmental contamination that gets into that bone while it's sitting in the ground. And these things are from the permafrost. They've been frozen. They're in great shape. Normally, ancient DNA looks more like this, which is the same thing from one of the Neanderthal bones that was used to create the full genome there. And you'll see there that only 3% of the sequences in that bone mapped to primates. The rest of it was stuff that they couldn't identify, which is most likely environmental bacteria and contamination. We have a bit of a solution for that in the ancient DNA community, and that is that we enrich these extracts for the thing that we're interested in. And there are lots of different ways that we can do this that I won't talk about now, but the goal of enrichment is to take this sample and to to capture these sequences and amplify up only those so that when we sequence it on one of these new fangled sequencing machines, we get much more of the stuff that we're interested in relative to the background stuff that we're not interested in. This doesn't mean the DNA is in better condition, but it means that we have to do less work to get more of that kind of bad DNA out of those samples. So that brings us to the final way that we're going to try to bring these things back to life, and that's by genome editing or copy, which is sequencing things, and then cut and paste. Find the stuff that we're interested in and paste it into a genome that we actually know, that actually exists, and potentially one where we can get complete cells, so that we don't have to figure out how to make a genome that we've sequenced function, which is something that we don't know how to do. So there are three steps to this. Um, the first is that we have to sequence stuff, and then these two are really where the magical science happens. We have to be able to deliver the genes and bits of genes that we've sequenced into a cell, into a genome of something that already exists, and find the exact location along that genome where it needs to go and paste it in, in precisely the right location, not in the wrong place, and that would cause trauma. So the first step, we kind of got um, sequencing costs have come down a lot recently. There are lots of different technologies. Illumina, this is a high seq machine. Illumina is probably the leader in the field right now. There's also life technologies, um, ion torrents, ion proton thing. This is the Roche machine and PacBio. Lots of different ways, there are some that aren't on here, that we can use to sequence things. That's not really as much of a problem as it is right now. The cost is coming down. We just have to do a lot of work in editing and assembling of different things. The delivery is a little bit harder. Um, People have been using uh, genome engineering technologies that I'm gonna talk about in the next couple of slides for a while now to try to engineer different genomes. And generally they're delivered into the cells using like um, bacteria, uh, plasmids, or uh, different viruses. This is one particular virus that is often used to deliver um, the genes into another cell. And recently it was discovered that the zinc finger proteins themselves can actually be used to deliver the different genes into the cells. But I'm gonna kind of skip over this because it's, it's complicated molecular biology and, and it's probably, probably good enough to do what we want to do, the delivery mechanisms, but they're, they're certain to be advances soon. The biggest challenge that we're facing is how to, once we have these things in the cells, how to find the place in the genome that the DNA you want to insert actually goes. Um, the first, one of the first experiments that actually went 
into uh, trial, um, it was the idea that, that this, uh, this severe uh, compromised immune system, the bubble boy disease, could be treated by breaking these genes, breaking the genes that they knew were associated with this disease. And the idea was that you could just take bits of DNA and randomly insert them into the genome. This would actually cause um, the, this, these genes to be broken, and that would help the people that were there. And, and this idea went to, to trial and wasn't, wasn't very good. It caused a lot of cancer. It didn't know where in the genome it was supposed to insert, and these, it broke the gene that it was supposed to break, but it also broke a lot of other genes. And so um, it was cited, probably generally known, that we needed to be much better at finding the correct place in the genome where we wanted to insert a gene or break a gene or turn a gene off. Um, the first uh, site-specific way of, of finding the place in the genome where you want to be was this thing called zinc finger nucleases. And this is the picture of, of how this worked. A zinc finger is basically a structure, and you see there's six here. There's three on this side and three on this side and then a protein complex here, enzymatic complex that actually cuts it. <coughs> These are recognized as specific place in the genome. So each of those, each of a zinc finger needs about three amino acids. And so this one will recognize three specific amino acids. This one will recognize three other amino acids, and this one three other amino acids. And they can be strung together so that there's a nine amino acid, not sorry, a nine base pair sequence that these things will have to be able to find in the genome in order to find the right place to bind. And this is another nine base pair region. So if you know the sequence, you can go to a library that different companies make available and different scientists have been involved in producing and choose the zinc fingers that will, uh, that will attach to the space in the genome that you're interested in and, and deliver them into the cells and they will find the place along the genome, cut in between, and then it'll cause uh, homologous recombination or non-homologous end joining. And this just means that you can change the bit of genome that's in there. So you can, if you have some DNA that you want to insert, you can co-deliver that with your zinc fingers and it will break the genome there and it will cause it to insert and, and there you go, you're gonna have some magical stuff happening. This is more a picture of what the zinc fingers look like. It's this kind of complicated 3D structure here and they each have three specific nucleotides they're interested in finding. You have this enzyme in the middle that cuts it and then after it's cut, you can insert DNA, you can delete DNA, you can do all sorts of different things. The picture here is from this really nice um, review paper that is in press in Trends in Biotechnology. If you're interested in learning more about how this technology works, I recommend going to this particular paper. So zinc finger nucleases are pretty awesome. You can go to a website and you can buy them. You can, you can actually te ask for people to string together three to six of these that you're interested in to make it more or less specific to which bits of the genome you want to grab hold of. And that's cool. It's really important and interesting. And uh, more recently, there's been uh, the discovery of something called talons, or transcription activator-like effector nucleases, which are slightly more precise in identifying the region of the genome that you want to cut. Instead of looking for three different nucleotides, they each actually bind to only one nucleotide. So you can engineer these long talons that look like the bit of the DNA that you want to grab hold of, and it will, with more specificity, grab a hold of this bit of the genome. Again, you stick in these enzymatic complexes which cut the DNA and enable you to insert the things that you're interested in. And this technology has been used for genomic engineering projects within the last few years. It's been used both in humans and in domestic crop species or, or other animal species, plant species that we're interested in engineering this technology. And then even more recently, like within the last year, um, has been the discovery of this other way of identifying the part of the genome that you want to engineer, called CRISPRs, or Clustered Regulation Interspace Short Palindromic Repeats. CRISPR is better, right? Um, so these things are cool because rather than rely on some specific long molecule that you get into the nucleus to find the bit of the DNA that you're interested in, you can actually use uh, RNA to find it. And so CRISPRs are, they were, uh, they were discovered in bacteria. They're kind of prokaryotic immune system. And it's this repeat thing. So you've got the CRISPR molecules in here. And in between each of these CRISPR molecules are sequences of things, of pathogens that have invaded bacteria. And the CRISPRs learn the sequence of these pathogens. And then when they see them again, they transcribe some RNA that goes and finds that DNA, goes and finds the invading thing that they don't want to be there, and breaks it. 
And so if we can engineer so that the bit of the DNA that we want to cut is actually within one of these, it, between one of these CRISPR repeats, we can then use this um, translation machinery, this whole enzymatic machinery that has evolved in bacteria to identify the right region of DNA and cut it. So this is hugely promising and, um, pot and potentially is much more specific, site specific, than, any, than, than either zinc fingers or talons. So the next question, after we figured out how to do the cutting and pasting, is to ask which parts of the genome we want to cut and paste. What makes a mammoth woolly, or the sea cow so big, or passenger pigeons flock together, or dodos um, reach sexual maturity before they reach physical maturity? What are the genes or sections of the genome that are responsible for this? And in order to understand this, I'm afraid that we're just going to have to sequence and annotate and understand these ancient genomes, which is something that is really very hard. And uh, I should add, and just wanted to, to say this, that we also have to be able to sequence and annotate a modern genome, a genome from something that's still alive, that's closely related to the ancient thing. And this was an experiment that was done um, by a group from Leipzig, Germany. They were trying, they were exploring idea space in what would happen if they sequenced the Neanderthal genome in a world where we didn't have the human genome to look at? So using a couple of different alignment methods, this is just taking the DNA sequences, that the short fragments of DNA sequences that come off the sequencing machine, and comparing them to the closest related genome that had been sequenced and assembled. So if we have the human, we see that we do pretty well with the short sequences that are there. If we take a step backward, we start doing worse, even at the level of the chimpanzee. So if we didn't have the human, and we did have the chimp, we still wouldn't be able to match as many of those ancient fragments as we had if we had the human. And as we step backward in time, you see that by the time you get here to the mouse lemur, which isn't that distant, we know how distant they are, we are missing most of the alignments. We, we're getting more data from the fossil than we can actually know what it is. And this makes our job of assembling and understanding the genome much, much harder. And not only that, but in this plot, what we have is the amount of divergence. So we know how far diverged these different things are from the Neanderthal. And the X here, the green X's here, mark the truth. So if we only had the mouse genome, for example, and we were trying to figure out how diverged the Neanderthal was from the mouse, we would, we would, it would look like the mouse was only, was actually, sorry, was actually only this much different from the human. And the reason is because when you start stepping backward in time, the only thing that you can actually sequence are the conserved regions of the genome. And so if all you're seeing is the stuff that's not changing, your estimates, your, your understanding of the divergence and the diversity between the two lineages um, is very hard. It's, it's almost impossible to do. So if you choose something to de-extinct that is very distantly related to anything that's still alive, like a dinosaur, it's going to be very hard to know what it is that you've actually sequenced because the only things that you can get out of the extinct genome are the stuff that hasn't changed in evolutionary time. So we should add to this list of who we should do uh, the criterion that it is actually possible to isolate, sequence, annotate, and understand the genomes of these things. So we've, we've done who, we know we're trying to de-extinct things, and we've talked a little bit about how, I'm not going to talk about where to put these things because I think this is more important when we start talking about liability. But I do think that um, we should consider deeply why we might want to de-extinct things. And that is my last comment. Thank you. Well, we have a few minutes for questions. And I want to lead off actually not with a question but with a comment and, a, and kind of an apology. I had uh, titled Beth's talk science, and it certainly was science, but it wasn't all of the science or sciences that would be involved in de-extinction. Beth's talk really takes us to the stage with the third genomic editing version of possibly having a genome that is quite similar to the extinct animal. You still have the sciences of turning that genome actually into a baby mammoth, the reproductive sciences. You've got the sciences of trying to raise a captive breeding herd someplace. And as I think the Bucardo story showed, raising wild animals in captivity, even animals that you've seen and know something about as opposed to extinct species may be tricky. 
And then last, and maybe the hardest of all, as we know from efforts at reintroducing animals to regions where they were locally extinct, like say the California condor, there's a lot of tricky science and politics and other things, but tricky science too, involved in actually going from a captive breeding population to a live, thriving population in the wild. So all that is science as well. I didn't ask Beth to talk about it. I think yeah. uh, she had plenty to talk about in the time that uh, she took. But I do want to note that there are scientific challenges beyond the ones that Beth talked about. However, we want to have some time today to talk about things that are uh, the ethical, legal, and political issues and not just the science. Yeah, um, just one comment about reproduction. and there's. There's so much in there that there's no way that I could have could have gotten to it all. But um, one of the biggest challenges with uh, with the reproduction is that once you have this genome or partial genome of something that's extinct, another thing that we can't really control is the expression of the genes. And a lot of this is controlled by the mother, actually, if the thing is in <clears throat> developing. If, Especially physical the gestational mother, the the gestational mother yeah. can turn these genes off and on, and so if you're looking at things that are very closely related to each other, there might be zero genetic differences between them, and the differences are actually in the level of gene expression at different points during development, and that may be controlled by the gestational mother rather than by the genome of the developing offspring, and there are other problems. I mean, if uh, if we think about putting a mammoth embryo in an elephant, and if we were to have all the genes associated with being a mammoth, it might not be so much of a problem if we only have some, but mammoths are much bigger. And one of the problems, this was pointed out by Adrian Lister, who's a paleontologist at, uh, University, at the Natural History Museum in London, who's a mammoth expert, was that it's not really known whether a mother elephant could carry a mammoth to term, because the baby mammoth is so much bigger that it might have disastrous consequences um, while during gestation. So there are, there are lots, lots of scientific problems that we, we aren't even close to being able to address. I guess I chose the things that, while they still seem like science fiction, were kind of closer to these than, uh, than any of these. So I wonder if we have elephant obstetricians who are qualified to do C-sections. Early in development That's and then bad. stick them into artificial yeah. wombs for the last of development. So, so the other reason I bring up these different areas of science is I think one can think about the extinction as a three-part process. The initial process of trying to create any individual from an extinct species. The process of trying to maintain and create and maintain a breeding flock or herd or something in captivity. And the third step being the process of trying to reintroduce it into the wild. And those are three that are, you know, to do number three, you have to do numbers one and two. You don't necessarily have to do number three uh, if you start down the path of one or two. But I'll shut up. Stuart. Hi, Stuart Brand from Revive and Restore. Beth, the, you mentioned the cost of sequencing keep coming down. Um, so I guess the two questions I have is your sense of the ongoing rate of improved sophistication and lowering costs of sequencing ancient DNA, and then also the sequence that you showed from zinc finger nucleases to talons to CRISPR to dot, dot, dot. Does it look to you like that's a continuing curve of improvement in low cost, or is that going to level off somehow? Um, hard to say. You know, there's a lot of biotech going on about sequencing right now, and particularly looking at different ways of sequencing things, using single molecules, et cetera. The, one of the biggest problems right now is that um, when genomics first got started, uh, people were using this long-range sequencing, the, the Sanger sequencing approach to put genomes together, like the Human Genome Project was done this way. And it was, it was hard to do this, but you had longer fragments and you could piece things together and people did it slowly and people did it well. And now you can go out and for 2,500 bucks, you can generate a ton of really short fragments that you can use to put together short chunks of genomes, and that's what people are doing now, sequence genomes. So we've got what's called a genome, but actually it's nowhere even close to being a genome. It's lots of different bits of genomes. We don't know where they go on chromosomes. We don't know how they piece together. We don't know anything about how they're expressed, how to annotate these genomes, et cetera. And that is just going to take time and bioinformatic development and other sequencing technologies to get through the hard bits, like repeat regions and uh, centromeres, which are really hard to get through. We don't, we, so we, well, we have genomes. We don't really have many good genomes. And the, the jump from 
having a genome to having an annotated genome, which we can use to identify the things that we might want to cut and paste in order to make these old thing, these these old things come back to life is is enormous. So we know a little bit about some model organisms. We know a little bit about dogs and something about horses, things that people are interested in for economic reasons. But as far as annotation, we can look at genes and we can say, well, this region is an ortholog to something that in the mouse, this which is a lab model organism, does this. Therefore, that's probably the gene associated with that. But we don't really know. And these are huge scientific steps that need to be taken. And so the sequencing costs is just one aspect. And you know. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi Beth, Kate Jones from uh, University College London. Um, I, you've probably said this already, but just humour me. Um, the transcriptomics of this must be a nightmare, and I was just wondering whether you could say something about that. You can't get, one cannot get a transcriptome from a fossil. Right, so and knowing, so it's knowing beyond that, nightmare. I would right, say. so how, how are you, you know, knowing that, knowing only the genome, the sequence of the genome is, barely even start. Right. So how on earth are you going to make a woolly mammoth right. or woolly bit of a mammoth? How, well, how does that work when you don't know what the transcriptomics is? Right. Which is another point to getting the complete annotated genome of the closest related thing. So if you have that, you can get a transcriptome so you can look for the, which proteins are being expressed in which tissue types and whatever it is that's most closely related to it gives you a good guess about what the genes are going to be in the animal that you're interested in bringing back to life. But until you try it, you're not going to know.